Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our 2023 pre-PDAC mining showcase, day number one. I am uh, David A. Talbot. I'm uh, head of research and uh, managing director here at Red Cloud Securities. And we have a great lineup for you today. We've got about 50 presenters in total. And tomorrow, we get to do it all over again. So we are going to have talks in four different rooms today. There will be the keynotes in this room, the Osgood Ballroom. All other sessions will be in other rooms. So we will have Hall A and B. Today is going to host lithium and silver later this afternoon. Hall C is pretty much copper all day long. And Hall E will host uranium and nickel later this afternoon. So all corporate talks today are going to be 20 minutes long. This is likely a 15 minute presentation and five minutes for, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, we will be recording sessions for uh, viewing later, but we will not be streaming live. Uh, during the Q&A sessions, we ask that you do raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you and so that the audience can hear and recording devices can hear what you are asking. Uh, there are washrooms in this area. There are some near the registration desk down the, uh, where the, es the uh, escalators are, where you came in. And there's additional washrooms across the hall here as well. Our lunch today, they, it will be served in this room right next to us, uh, next to the Osgood Ballroom at 12.10 p.m. Uh, we have about 25 minutes prior to the lunch. Uh, sorry, we have about 25 minutes for the lunch, and uh, then that's just before the fireside chat to start at 12:35, and that's in this room. Today, we are very pleased to have Ross Beatty, chairman of Equinox Gold. He will be joined by Red Cloud Securities CEO Bruce Tatters and Red Cloud Financial Services TV personality Mark Bunting. And just want to remind everybody uh, that we saved the best to last. We have a cocktail reception at 4.30 p.m. today in the foyer near registration. So please uh, uh, join us for that. And uh, you know, we ask that you put your phones on silent. So I should do that now. There we go. Silent mode off, silent mode on. So now to kick off today, I would like to say a few words about the uranium market. And I apologize if you've already heard much of this, as it was published in the uh, Northern Miner last week, and I think they sent it out on LinkedIn yesterday as well. But the uh, title of the uh, article was Uranium Market Gathers Momentum uh, Towards a Supply Shortfall. Geopolitical and security of supply fears are driving term contracting. So after about a dozen years in the doldrums, we have uranium prices on the rise, and this is supported by real growing demand and support for nuclear power, as well as geopolitical concerns. Now, while in the recent past, support for nuclear power was based on environmental considerations and its ability to provide reliable, cheap, baseload energy, Russia's invasion of Ukraine shifted the geopolitical landscape from these considerations to one of an energy security consideration. Now, Western government policies have pivoted in response to the sector and the sector is gaining momentum. Uranium prices have been on the rise for the last four years and they have accelerated. And perhaps most important is that utilities are returning to long-term contracting. There is rising uranium demand and diminishing secondary supplies, and this has spurred an increase in, in production. Now, rising long-term contracts, uh, sorry, long-term prices, and increased contract volumes are really needed to drive the price incentive further for uranium producers to bring production back online or to start up new projects. Now, that said, uranium supplies, they do remain tight, and further price appreciation is really anticipated. Mine supply is forecast at 143 million pounds uh, of U308 this year versus 181 million pounds of demand for, 20, for 2023 by UXC, UX Consulting. And that leaves a notable gap in mine supply, and that must be filled by declining secondary supplies. Now, geopolitics is a very important topic these days. Nuclear power, uranium markets, they're heavily impacted by these geopolitical concerns. And I'd say this is largely due to Russia's influence over the nuclear fuel cycle. That includes uranium supply, conversion, enrichment, and their control over the gas supply chain as well. Now, the war has contributed greatly to Europe's soaring power and, uh, and fuel prices, and that's causing some countries to accelerate new nuclear power plants. 
That includes France, Poland, and it has reversed or at least stalled closure plans in other countries, such as Germany and Belgium. Now, Bloomberg noted, noted that the EU has spent an additional $1 trillion on energy since the war began, impacting businesses and consumers alike. As the war drags on, we expect that nuclear utilities will scramble to cover their uranium requirements. Security of supply might overshadow economics over the next few years, such that we might see additional funding of domestic nuclear programs, R&D, and uranium industry support. Support for nuclear power is growing in the U.S., the EU, and elsewhere. Energy security supply and environmental considerations are changing government policy and investor sentiment. Policy decisions by governments over the last few years has really started to translate into new nuclear reactor announcements, builds, life extensions, and the cancellation of some closures. And this is the real nuclear power demand growth driver and higher uranium prices that might help us emerge from a dozen years of low uranium prices might be on the, uh, on the cusp. So in the U.S., the 2021 Infrastructure Bill and the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act have provided funding and test investment tax credits and loan guarantees in support of nuclear energy. Premature shutdowns have ceased, and the reopening of closed plants is even being considered. We estimate that about 1.1 million pounds worth of, uh, worth of uranium, worth about $68 million, and minor fuel services were purchased within the initial $75 million round of buying by the U.S. Uranium Reserve. Five uranium companies received an average of $62 a pound, and that compares to about $50 a pound spot prices currently. Canada has also committed $1 billion towards mo small modular nuclear reactors thus far, and there are four nuclear power plant lives that are to be extended. Globally, China dominates the narrative, as reactor builds are accelerating potentially to eight to 10 new reactors per year. Its midterm goal is uh, to, uh, to have a world-leading fleet of 150 operating nuclear reactors. So that's 50% more than the U.S. South Korea has reversed policy. They plan to have achieved 33% nuclear in its energy mix by 2023. Japan, which is particularly impacted by liquid natural gas imports and pricing, is striving for faster reactor restarts and longer life extensions in, in response for the Russian invasion. It plans to increase its operator reactor count from 10 to 12, uh, sorry, 10 to 17 by mid this year, and ultimately to 35, including two new builds. India continued to look to expand its fleet of 22 reactors, with eight under construction and 12 more planned. And other developing nations seek nuclear power, including Bangladesh, Egypt, Turkey, Philippines, and Indonesia. But we expect production to fall short. Uranium production is on a rise, but a gap remains. Production uh, is expected to continue to rise by about 8% uh, this year to 132.5 million pounds. Uh, sorry, from 132.5 million pounds to 143 million pounds this year. However, this will fall short of that expected demand of 181 million pounds, as I had mentioned earlier. And that's despite several restarts at several different projects. We're looking at Lance, Lost Creek, Rosita in the U.S., Honeymoon in Australia, uh, the continuing ramp up of Cameco's MacArthur River in Saskatchewan, and then a 6% increase on Kazakh production as well. African projects are also being given a new look in, in light of this elevated geopolitical risk, with Langer Heinrich anticipated to return to production next year, and the DASA, Keokera, Maduela, and, and Tiris projects all being advanced. Now, despite this growth, UX forecasts a uranium supply deficit of 13 million pounds this year, which will likely be filled through commercial inventory drawdown. Deficits will persist, but they might shrink in the 2024-2025 period, after which these deficits are expected to increase significantly, with a cumulative production gap of roughly 345 million pounds anticipated by 2023. Now, despite potential for higher prices, production challenges and uncertainties remain for miners, including supply, issue chain, uh, supply chain issues, 
permitting and funding requirements, and overly optimistic production estimates and development timelines. However, the long period of low uranium prices has had a major impact on the uranium mining industry. Current supply remains insufficient to meet reactor requirements, and the challenges outlined above may push some of the projects off into the future. Previous discoveries are required to maintain supply, particularly since there was a trend towards the development of smaller deposits and lower grades last cycle. The negative impact of grades and inflation means that future uranium prices will have to account for higher expected production costs. Secondary supplies, which plugged the 55 million pound gap in mine, between mine production and demand last year, is also anticipated to tighten. Secondary supplies will likely fill that 35, 38 million pound gap between supply and, and mine production this year, and that therefore accounting for 21% of total supply. And because of this, further commercial inventory drawdowns will likely take place as, spark, uh, as spot market supplies are less available, but it won't be quite as dramatic as it has been in the past. It is also likely governments and Western enrichers will reduce sales and underfeeding will decrease. Now we believe that real demand is driving prices right now. Spot prices have risen from 30 bucks a pound at the end of 2020 to 42 bucks a pound at the end of 2021 to 48 bucks a pound at the end of last year. And after peaking at 63 bucks a pound in April last year on speculation of Russian sanctions, uh, the current spot price has sort of, uh, you know, let's say firmed up at around 51 bucks a pound. So it's up about 6% year to date. Now, we do believe that there is a war premium built into this price, and we are more relieved, though, that uh, real uranium demand is really driving up the long-term prices. We do believe spot drivers for this year, they will include renewed investor interest in uranium, ongoing purchases by Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, additional discretionary buying by utilities, and a weaker U.S. dollar, which could make uranium more attractive in foreign, ex uh, in foreign currencies. Now, vo the volatile spot market and geopolitical concerns have accelerated nuclear utilities' return to contracting, and the strengthening term market is exactly what the doctor ordered. Long-term prices have trended upwards over the past four years, increasing 23% from 33 bucks a pound to 40.50 by the end of 2021, up 26% to 51, uh, 51 bucks a pound over 2022, and that's the largest gain we have seen since 2007. Term prices right now up 3% year to date to 53 bucks a pound. Excuse me. Now last year, 2022 term contracting rose 58% to 113 million pounds of uranium. And that's versus the average of about 73 million pounds per year over most of the past decade, at least according to UXC. And this is the highest level we've seen since 2005 to 2006. Now the average contract size was uh, larger last year as well. Contracting by US utilities rose 54% uh, to account for about 61% of the term trading volumes and most of that is for the 2023 to 2029 period. Now, non-US utility contracts weren't quite as large, but often did have longer periods. So term contracts, you know, they, they are now largely market-related, and they incorporate base escalated prices. Uranium producers, they remain the primary sellers at 86% of the volume, but that's up from about uh, 64 or 65% in prior years. Uh, what that meant, it means, is intermediary sales fell from 22% to about 3% as the number of carry trades fell considerably. Now, even with this increased term contracting, uncovered reactor requirements, they total 1.3 billion pounds to 2020, 2030. And over the past five years, roughly 430 million pounds has been contracted, with chemical alone accounting for about 150 million of those of la over the last 14 months. Now this is the well short of the 775 million pounds used by the nuclear reactors during the same period. So the lack of investment in uranium mining and exploration since Fukushima has mainly con uh, have main many concerned about supply sources. 
Furthermore, secondary supplies have declined and spot market trading has declined as financial entities and uranium companies have entered the market and removed material. The Russian invasion has been a major factor for uranium price increases and higher contract volumes by both U.S. and non-U.S. utilities, and this trend is likely to continue. Cameco has already announced 80 million pounds worth of contracts this year, and while existing shipments from Russia currently have no trade restrictions, there have been threats of trade actions by the U.S., the EU, Canada, and even threats coming the other way by Russia threatening to cut off supply. And then there's the other ongoing challenges, including inflation and supply chain constraints. Essentially, a lack of access to uranium supplies or conversion and enrichment services, transportation, rising interest rates, and foreign exchange risk. So de these declining uranium stocks means the market is tightening. Production curtailment over recent years was due to low prices and to COVID-19, and that led to this uh, reliance on uranium inventories. Now, stocks have declined in the West, while buying really is taking place in the East. So government stockpiles, they have essentially seen limited selling, and demand by financial entities and several uranium producers have also removed millions of pounds from the spot market. Another positive for mine production demand is a shift to overfeeding from underfeeding for enrichment companies, which, is, which have been spending money on further enrichment of their existing uranium inventories, and that's essentially underfeeding. The excess material was sold into the market. Now, with conversion demand rising, what we are seeing is more overfeeding. That means more uranium consumption and less time spent on converting supplies and stockpiles with lower tails assays. That means more uranium from the mines. It means a higher proportion of U-235 being sent to the enrichment plants, and that'll be sent more quickly. So that's all I have to say, so thank you very much.